and welcome. I have another wonderful interview today, Dr. Sean Robinson, who is a full-time reading instructor at Madison College and a senior research associate in the Wisconsin's Equity and Inclusion Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's also an entrepreneur and the founder of Dr. Dyslexia Dude LLC. He's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh with a Bachelor of Science degree in Human Services and a master's in education from DePaul University. He also has his PhD in language and literacy from Cardinal Stritch University. He has over 40 peer reviewed publications and received several distinguished honors throughout his early career and quite a few awards, including um, served as a fellow for 2015, the eighth annual Asa Hilliard III and Barbara Sizemore Research Institute on African Americans and Education and American Educational Research Association. He received an Educator of the Year Award from Allstate Insurance, and he's also a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha um, fraternity. Welcome so much, Dr. Robinson. I'm pleased to have you today Thank on you. my series on diversity, equity, and culture, where we're sharing various information regarding language and literacy. And we know that there are um, many domains of literacy, listening, comprehension, um, verbal expression, reading and writing, and all of those are very important. So it's just good to have diverse voices on this topic here. And we know that it's important to give kids access, especially our kids with special needs, access to equitable literacy instruction. And I know I'm a speech therapist and also educational specialist that works with kids with learning disabilities and um, so forth. And we know that um, according to the 2019 National Assessment of Educational Progress, only 34% of fourth graders in the U.S. were reading at or above grade level. So today's interview will focus on culturally responsive literacy instruction, and I know that your mission is definitely to reach and serve and empower students with dyslexia and special education to achieve greatness. So just very pleased to have you today, Dr. Robinson. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. Yes, wonderful. So the first thing I want to touch on is what was your motivation for pursuing higher education in the area of language and literacy? Um, I re really wanted to just learn more about myself um, and how I can serve students. You know, particularly I have dyslexia and it's impacted my, my life, you know, not just my academic career, but, you know, my other parts of my life, career, social. Um, so I just really wanted to be able to... Um, find ways to learn more about language and literacy, particularly within the context of dyslexia and how I could use not just research, but my own lived experiences to serve um, other kids. And I mean, serve is, you know, um, there's more than just writing research papers, right? Because kids are not going to read that stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> people, I mean, families, parents are not going to read it, right? And it's just more for your peers in the academy. But service to me is like, how can I really use the gifts that I've been given to inspire other kids who find themselves in similar situations that, that I was as a young youth. And so, um, you know, I just really want to dig in more about um, different aspects of, of language and literacy. And so um, I just went on and went on and, you know, plugged, plugged, plugged on through to get my degree. Yes, I think that's fantastic. And we know that language and literacy is definitely the foundation for academics, right? To be able to read on grade level and all that. Can you just please describe a little bit more your experience as an adolescent receiving a diagnosis of dyslexia as a senior in high school? And what was positive about your intervention that you received at the Project Success Program in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh? Uh, yeah, so I, I wasn't diagnosed to, um, until almost the end of my uh, junior year in high school. And so um, at that time, um, I was pretty much self-destruction. You know, it's like that hip-hop song, self-destruction. Everyone's Like I was just on a a rampage like I didn't really have any control or love for myself um you know I was involved with coaching Special Olympics which really was a part of who I am and my identity I've been coaching over 20 years in service but like academically I had no identity and so it wasn't um until Dr. Robert T. Nash um really diagnosed me and said uh, I was one of the most literate kids he's ever seen in his life and that um, I had been failed by the system and that I had dyslexia. And at that time, you know, my mom and I were like, what's, what's dyslexia? Like, we, we had no idea, you know. So he explained, you know, about the sounds and phonemic awareness and fluency and things that really impact, you know, students' um, language proficiency and, and, and having access to language. And so when he, when he taught me um, how to read after I graduated high school, reading at an elementary level, um, I was just, 
I guess I never looked back. I just became a sponge mm -hmm. and I absorbed as much knowledge as I could and knowledge, not just from the academy, but knowledge of life and how I could really, um, you know, use my experiences as a vessel to move forward. And so um, um, what the project did was it was my um, springboard into society. You know, we think about the statistics of of not just students with disabilities, but students of color that come out of high school, right? What the statistics are of uh, grad high school graduation, and then even in college, right? It's very, very low. And so um, I was a statistic, and um, they just gave me a appreciation how to um, love language, um, love the dictionary, uh, love how to use a dictionary. And so uh, once he taught me the skills of, you know, connecting graphemes, phonemes together, and really understanding uh, linguistics and understanding prefix, suffix, root words. Like it just, I became a little um, ling linguistic person myself. I just studied in undergrad. I just loved um, learning how to put words together and how to make meaning of it. And just, I don't know, it just was my motivation to continue to uh, move throughout the my academic uh, journey. And I think it's so important how uh, mentorship really makes a difference. If you have the right person to lead you in the right direction, and I'm sure that your mentor at the time provided some good um, instruction with structured literacy, with like phonology, phonology, morphology, semantics, how all those come together, the graphemes and teaching you all of that. It's fantastic. Can you share a little bit, what are some of your previous and or current research projects with Wisconsin's Equity and Inclusion Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin in Madison? Yeah, so we're um, working on a special issue now in the um, urban education, looking at um, students in uh, urban communities doing a special issue and it should be coming out um, within the next year, uh, particularly around reading and mathematics for students of color and looking at disparities and how we can really change that narrative in urban education, um, you know, to really provide um, high instructional access to curriculum versus, you know, always hearing about the same narrative about young students of color in urban schools, you know, they can't do this, they're, they're thugs, they're, you know, criminals, they're at risk, they're, you know, deficit, you know, learning. It's like, no, 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 like, they're no different than anybody else. So I'm uh, really just trying to change that narrative and come out with some real good work for some, some colleagues of mine, scholars across the country who are contributing to this work. That's great. And I think it's great that you're studying it in urban areas. And I live in Atlanta, which is um, an urban area, but my area is more suburban, uh, mixed suburban and urban. But it's so important that these kids get identified early. So proper assessments of literacy and language instruction, and then whether it's the um, response to intervention or MPSS, to make sure they have early intervention. The earlier they intervene, and then that the literacy instruction is targeted. Because you know, when I work on listening comprehension, oral expression, some of the foundational phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, those kids are able to make the progress. So I think that's fantastic that. Um, at the Wisconsin Equity and Inclusion Lab that you guys are, you know, looking at in urban, you know, in yes. urban um, areas, such as... Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's, just not, it, it's just not urban, too. It's, you know, even think about rural communities, too, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, reservation, Native Americans on the res, right? Like, a lot of people don't think about mm -hmm. um, res or rural, and, you know, most of the time it's usually suburban or people who have the capital, right? Well... Mm -hmm. Not everyone has the capital, right? And and we when we define urban, it doesn't always have to be black and brown students, right? There could be students who are, you know, white that live in urban communities too, or rural, you know, America and reservations. So um, it's just about access, like you said, it's early identification and providing, you know, not just the teachers with the, the proper training, but the, have the parents be knowledgeable about what's out there for their for their son or daughter, so they can, you know, really help, you know, them as they manifest through school and navigate, you know, a, a um, special education program that's not always beneficial for students of color. I mean, yeah, it's just, absolutely. So regardless uh, of where they live, what zip code they yeah. live in, all kids, you know, they can have possibly a diagnosis of dyslexia. And we know that sometimes genetics plays a role into that. So it's definitely important for them to have access to early identification and then appropriate um, treatment. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I am. Um, Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 you know, my full-time job as a reading instructor at Madison College is community college. And we talk about early access, right? But it's not the case for a lot of adult learners that, I, that are in my, in my class. So mm -hmm. I teach a class, a word analysis, um, that's usually really tailored towards teacher training. But I shifted it and now providing it for adult learners at the community college. And um, a good portion of these um, adults that enroll in my class are reading at an elementary level. So they've gone majority of their life 
not knowing how to read. So you ask yourself, well, what happened when they were, you know, in elementary school or pre-K? Like, where was the diagnostic assessment then? And where was the assessments? Where was the early intervention? And they went all this time, and now they're in the real world, and they're struggling. Like, not just with oral communication, but listening, like, you know, in uh, proper enunciation and writing, like, you know, it, it's uh, it's rewarding to do it, but also I can feel the pain because I was there and, you know, you're dealing with adults who are, are psychologically broken and it's it takes a lot, you know, to try to um, build that confidence back up and give them hope so they can feel like they're um, something to contribute in their own communities and society. So, you know, even with adults, you know, they're, they're looking at, you know, understanding graphing, phoneme, syntax, semantics, morphology, vocabulary. Same instructional methods that you teach, probably a young kid, they're getting it too. And you know, imagine being 45, 50 years old and learning that stuff. Like it could be, you know, like embarrassing. That's, you know, it's a daunting task and they can be feel embarrassed. I think it's phenomenal that you're providing that service. Because I have worked with uh, middle school students who struggle with um, literacy and then a reading way below grade level. So I can imagine as a high schooler and then as an adult to be reading way below grade level and have dyslexia, not an easy thing, right? And it can spill into many areas of their life, self-esteem, personal relationships, and so forth. Being able to get a job, you know, access to proper employment and all of that, being able to be truly literate. So I think that's yeah. phenomenal. And you said that you said the key word we talked about all day, access. Like mm -hmm. access and affordability. Like a lot of parents can't afford private tutoring. A lot of parents can't afford to send their kids to a private school. So then it becomes an access issue. But the community college, the course is free. All you do is enroll in college and it's free. So they're getting, you know, something that's accessible and affordable too at the same time. And that's something that, you know, um, I love about the community college because they, they're at that, you know, service mentality and they really want to be able to reach communities that are otherwise not being uh, served. Yes, and I think that's important what you say too, to make sure that they're really getting the proper instruction. That just working in the middle school setting years previously, what I find is sometimes what happens to the teachers, they know how to teach these skills and remediate the things, but what happens, they end up what I call pushing the curriculum, right? They're having to teach the reading comprehension, they give them accommodations for their IEPs, but unfortunately what gets left behind is all those prerequisite skills that they never learned. Phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, reading fluency, reading decoding, all those specific skills, it just gets skipped unfortunately, is what happens. And a lot of these kids, unfortunately, get passed along year after year with their IEP. So somehow we have to, um, early intervention is important, but we have to make sure that the kids are really mastering the IEP goals and before not just passing along, passing along. So lots of good things there. Um, you know, areas of need still. Um, I would love you to talk a little bit about the International Dyslexia Association. What exactly is that association and what are the benefits for membership? Um, you know, again, access, right? Like you get access to, um, you know, the journals, you get access to, you know, information, you get, um, you know, be able to really uh, put yourself in the position where you're in a community of people who are like-minded mm -hmm. and you can really start building a community. And I think that's very important in this space we're in is that we build community. And that is one of many organizations where you can feel that you have a voice and you feel like you have a seat at the table. And so um, I, I think it's, you know, any, any organization that really focus on literacy, I think it's important. You know, I think that, you know, particularly at a national level or international level, um, you get access to, you know, um, scholars, scholarship that really addresses, um, you know, dyslexia, not just in America, but also how it affects students who are identified as ESL learners too, right? Like, so you, you, just, you just get a lot of knowledge, I think, that you may may or may not be able to access if you weren't a member, if that, um, if that exactly. makes sense. And I know that you um, serve on the board of directors too, so I know you have some important roles there too, probably with disseminating information. What are some of the other roles you're serving on? Uh, the, um, can you say it again, please? What are some of the other roles that you participate in at as a board member of the International Dyslexia Association? It's, it's, it's really a dissemination, right? Tr mm -hmm. Try to really, um, you know, address policy, right? Because that's where it starts, right? Policy at the higher level and then how it trickle down and how we could be advocates to policy and policy change. I know here in Wisconsin, a um, couple of uh, mothers who are part of the uh, branch of Wisconsin, IDA branch and also uh, decoding dyslexia have really pushed um, for policy to be changed, legislation, and they're, they're getting it. Like they're, they're getting... Um, some things change. So I just think it's about 
uh, advocacy and dissemination and really just hitting the ground running and kind of like my pastor said, feet to the street. You got to get out there. You got to really just be a, a vessel and a voice and, you know, just be like a bull and keep moving until you get things done for the kids. Because it's about the kids, right? I mean, the generation of kids that we lose every year if we don't, uh, you know, catch them before they fall into the, through the cracks. Exactly. The school to prison pipeline is a very serious thing, you know? I know here in Georgia, they passed a Senate bill, I think it was last year or the year before, regarding dyslexia. So I know in my area, there's a lot of advocacy going around now about getting dyslexia um, assessments and so forth. So definitely important. Why do you think students with language-based learning disabilities or dyslexia require that systematic and structured instruction to truly thrive? There's so many different reading programs out there, but why do they really need that structured literacy intervention to truly thrive and learn to read properly? You know. I mean, uh, let's lets them, uh, you know, feel confident, independent, mm -hmm. allows them to uh, feel some success, right? And how we define the success is, you know, really up to the student. But I think, you know, from my experience of learning to read and the people, I, and the students I work with, adult learners or middle school, high school kids, you know, it's like cracking that code, right? Mm -hmm. Once that light clicks, they take off. They're like, they soar like an eagle. They're gone. And so, you know, um, I just think that really helps them have a, a good appreciation of our sound structure of our language and how to be, how to master it proficiently, um, not just in oral communication, but writing and reading it and just feeling confident. Like, you know, um, some students can't come to a word and or, uh, attack it and break it up in parts and they need that systematic, sequential, explicit, direct instruction to really understand how to construct the word, take it apart, put it together, put it together, take it apart. And um, just that drill, like they just need it. I know I do. And so um, I still practice uh, myself too. Um, and so I just think having that, that instruction levels the playing field for students with dyslexia really allows them to feel like they can be competitive um, in the sense of um, the academy, academically, they can compete, you know, with, with not just themselves, but in, in their space too. Yes, I like what you say about cracking the code because it's basically teaching them the skills that they need to really be successful, giving them the tools to be able to use the phonological awareness, you know, all of those different skills that they need to really be able to decode the words and then improve their reading fluency and all of that. So, because um, I know at different public school systems and private schools, they may use like the Wilson method or Orton Gillingham or those different methods that they may use. Sometimes in Pennell, there's so many different literacy um, programs out there. Um, Barton and so forth and there's components in all of them that are pretty good. I know Orton Gillingham is one of the gold standards, but basically it needs to be systematic, right? To have the phonology, all those different components, morphology, all of that as a part of it. How do you think educators and speech language pathologists can provide culturally responsive literacy instruction? Why is it so important? And I did get a copy of your um, graphic novel, which I was very well, excited to, to receive, too. Well, thank you. So, um, of course, we serve a wide variety of demographics and so forth. But why is it important to be truly culturally responsive and, like, the materials and such that we're using? Uh, you know, I just think it, it provides us students, like, the access, right? They have something to connect with. Like, they're <laughs> something they, they can find themselves um, knowing that they're not alone, right? They, they see, they feel mm -hmm. empowered. It's a healthy uh, message of equity, self-confidence. Like those things to me are all about culture responsive, right? It really sends a message of unity, like to be patient, to listen, to allow students to have a voice at the table. And a lot of times students, particularly with learning disabilities and students of color, their voices are silent, like they're silent. So how can I as an educator or a speech pathologist or just somebody, a reading teacher, reading specialist, whatever my role is, how can I build that relationship because that's the most important piece like once you build that relationship everything else kind of falls and it's together without that relationship it's it's kind of you know lost cause you know it's going to be hard to really connect with that student get them motivated get them in if, if you don't really you know um honor their voice honor their pain honor where they've come from you know allow them to just be themselves and i think that's really something that for me with Dr. Nash, so the white guy, like he was like, hey man, I'm not black, I'm not biracial. I can't even relate to that. But what I can relate to is that you're feeling and reading, I wanna help you. So let me listen to you, let me let me honor your voice. And I think that that connection was like, it just, you know, really, and that's why I think I go back when I work with people, I always think about listening to people first and being patient with them and 
allowing them just to express themselves. I think once they do that, kind of hooks them. That makes sense. I'm not sure. No, absolutely. I think just building a rapport. So if you're working with an elementary school student, high school student, adult education, like you work with, it's important to connect with them and treat them as a human being, recognize that they have strengths, even though they have dyslexia, um, reading disability, you know, that they have some things that they could probably be very good at as well, which is just something that is a area of need for them that you're helping them to remediate those literacy skills. So once you can connect with them, let them know that, hey, this is not your strong area, but it can still improve. And you can connect with them on that level. And then if you can use materials that are more interesting to them, hook them, um, engage with them in different ways, crack a joke here and there, whatever it is, so you, you know, get the kids interested in what you're doing. I think that's important, you know? Uh, and that's, and that's the reason why we, we wrote uh, Dr. Dyslexia Dude, my wife and I, because, <laughs> you know, I had put myself in, in um, thinking back when I was in elementary school and what would have maybe helped me, maybe not. You know, I don't know. But one thing I, I thought, you know, what could have benefited was having that type of book that would have maybe motivated me and allowed me to feel like oh, it's okay to feel this way and knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And so just, again, that service piece of being able to really mm -hmm. um, use my life experience, research, um, scholarship to really, you know, shift it and allow students to see themselves as being superheroes and being able to, you know, really Mm -hmm. um, overcome anything they want. They just put their mind to it. Like everything's a mind shift. You know, um, mm -hmm. I tell students, I spent 18 years getting my degree after high school, 18 straight years after high school. After, after I got kicked out, I graduated. The next 18 years of my life was all school. That's a long, that's a long time. I'm tired. Like I'm, I don't want to go back to school ever again. Mm -hmm. I can care less about going back to school. I don't want to look at school. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just schooled out, but the, it's the mind shift. Like like students with dyslexia, I think when I work with students, it's just, you know, like I said, that connection, but it's that, that mind, you have to help them shift their thinking, you know, and sometimes it's difficult to get through that mud if you've been in that mud for so long. So, um, you know, I had teachers that failed me in undergrad, you know, I had two professors in my PhD that failed me and told me um, I wasn't going to be anything, told me I was never going to be a published author. Like, I heard all that stuff, like, but again, it was just a mind shift. I told myself what I can do versus what somebody's going to tell me I can't do. And that's the same thing with learning to read. Like, you can do it. Like, you're, if you get the tools and the strategies and the right teacher and the right patience, you can do it. But if you don't get the right stu the teacher and the right strategies, then it's going to be harder for you. And then you're going to start feeling down. And you're going to start feeling angry. And you're going to give up on yourself. And we can't, we can't afford that. Like, we got to find ways to get students moving, like a little train. Choo, choo. They just got to keep moving. I have worked with a lot of boys. So I know in the fall, I'll definitely be sharing this. I bought a couple of copies and I know that they'll like this and it shows them that they're human and they may have struggles in life and there's going to be things that are challenging for them, but you can kind of just work through it, you know? And then it's important to have those people that care about you that can kind of motivate you and inspire you to kind of keep on going, you know? Um, and I like that aspect of it. So I can see that being beneficial for kids. And I saw on your website that you're turning it into an app now. There's an app available. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, it was not available yet. Um, we're, we're, we're working on a, a, a game-based, um, uh, authentic, culturally responsive, realistic um, program for um, students um, with dyslexia and um, really focusing on, um, you know, um, stu stu all students with dyslexia, but the, the characters in the, in the game are going to be um, of color because it's important that students see themselves versus seeing animals, you know, like, a frog or a dog, you know, in some of these uh, games that students see. So we want something that's going to be authentic, that students can really, you know, catch on to and be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm into it, like I'm engaged. Yeah, to make sure that it's relatable, you know, I can definitely yes. see a lot of the middle school and high school boys, depending what age level they're to be interested in something that's, you know, the gaming, <laughs> the gaming things and things like that to draw their interest, you know, but I really like that, um, the, the Dr. Dyslexia dude's character that you came up with, it's just fantastic. Um, yeah, we um we we actually um are on book three right now. It's getting illustrated right now, and, and we added um three new superheroes. I can't get too much information out because you know it's a, it's a surprise, but um it's gonna it's these new three new characters that my my wife uh, really thought about um are creative and um they're really authentic and realistic. And there's also a um a woman of color in there too with superpowers. So be, you know it's 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 gonna be uh. A good one. And I find your story very inspiring, especially I work with, again, a lot of um, boys of color, elementary school level, and I've worked with older kids too. So I find your story very inspiring because a lot of them have dyslexia 
some diagnose some undiag you know, undiagnosed and literacy disorders and so forth. So I just think it's important for them to know that they too can succeed. There's going to be things that they're good at, things that they're not so good at, but if they can really just motivate themselves, find something that can be uh, motivating to them um, to just drive them to keep pushing, I think that's very important. And your success story, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, yeah, but thank you. That's that's life though, right? Like yeah. we're, we're, we're born and then we leave the earth and no matter our journey between the time we're born and the time we leave, there's gonna be trials and tribulations. Like there's, there's you know, we're gonna fall on their face. We're gonna hit rock bottom. We're gonna find times we want to give up. Like we're gonna cry. We're gonna be emotional. We're gonna be angry. Like that's that's life. And we gotta like for me, I gotta learn how to you know um, just keep moving. And I think that's one thing that taught me having dyslexia, all the pain I went through, and the the failures and trials and tribulations and letdowns, and um, it's taught me you know to appreciate life and have that mentality. Well, look, I'm never gonna give up. Like if, if I put my mind to it. I'm doing it. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep doing it until I master it. Same thing with reading. Like, you just got to keep practicing it. And once you practice and practice and it clicks, you just kind of take off and it becomes a natural process then. Definitely. What are some um, motivational um, words that you would have for kids in elementary school or middle school that may be struggling with language and literacy that you would say to encourage them? The little you know, just never give up. You know, it's okay, it's okay to feel the way you feel. You know, um, they don't um, allow yourself to, you know, get to a point where you're going to be like a balloon and you pop and you explode and you get in fights or you, you know, you curse at somebody. I used to do that. Like I used to curse at people and teachers do chairs at teachers, you know, hit people randomly. Like, so I'm not saying something I haven't done before mm -hmm. and it, it didn't help. Like, cause it got me removed from class. And so, you know, thinking back to young kids now is it's okay to feel this way. Like it's, it's okay to feel emotional. It's okay to cry. It's okay to say, you know, uh, Miss, Mrs. Anderson, I don't know what I'm doing. Please help me. Like, it's okay. Just to, just to ask, like, get off your chest. Don't hold that stuff in because it's going to boil up and it's going to explode and it's not going to help you. Um, you know, and it's just, it's not a healthy feeling to be in that, in that dark box. And, and so for any young elementary school, middle school kid, you know, it's okay to feel this way, you know, um, just know that, um, if you put the work in, you're going to feel some success and the success is not defined by me not defined by your teachers, it's defined by you as a student. What what do you want? Like, what do you want to put into this to get out of it? And so I just think that, you know, you can never give up and you just got to keep moving. You know, just like Muhammad Ali on the ropes, you just got to keep bobbing and weaving. I mean, uh, you know, and um, just listen. Like, listen to your teachers, listen to yourself. Um, I know I'm probably, like, repeating myself, but just, it's okay to, it's okay to, 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 um, to fail. It's, it's not okay not to try. So, you know, if you try and you fail, okay, you fail. But if you don't try, then, you know, you never know if you do it or not. So I always tell kids, just go for it. Like, you know, just move. Just, you know, if you if you fail, we fail. I fail too. And then like, hey, it's okay. You know, we learn and we, we grow together. Yes, you can definitely learn from your mistakes and your struggles and then move past it. And then with the emotions, kids can learn to, or with time to regulate their emotions. You know, it's okay to experience a range of emotions, but this may be in a more appropriate way to express it in school or with your family to that. I'm all about connecting kids with resources. So although I provide school-based speech therapy services, I also provide from time to time private practice services and I'm all about community support and connecting kids with whatever resources they may need in the community because I think it really takes a village. So with a child with language disability, learning disability, dyslexia, it really takes a whole village of folks to kind of come together to get these kids on the right path. You know, some of them are are on the right path and some of them just need a little bit of motivation and um, a positive light in their life to kind of motivate them. And I think support the well, family because the families get stressed out too. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. You know, yeah. along this journey of, okay, that's why you have to have the right reading program. It's not all of them are, it's not, I always say, it should not just be one blanket special education instruction for students. It's tailored. It should be tailored to their individual needs. That's what all, what equity is about. Yeah. And I think responsive therapy. Make sure it's what this particular child needs. Yes. No, I'm 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 with you 100 percent Also, you said something too, I think it's important too, is it's counseling. Like, right? Like a lot of boys are feel prideful. Well, I'm not going to counseling. I ain't doing that. It's for wimps. Like, no, I go to counseling. Like, it's okay. Like, I'm 43 years old. I go to counseling. I cry. Like, I get emotional. I'm human, but that's healthy. Like, I let it out. And I think about my time in high school. When I got kicked out of high school, went to, you know, a turn of high school for the troubled kids, right? 
I had to go to counseling and I actually enjoyed it because it was actually allowed me to, you know, share things that I might not have been comfortable sharing with my mom or sharing with my, my friends. Like it was, uh, it was healthy for me. So then I started doing that in undergrad and, and then my master's is in school counseling. So I, I found myself then, you know, doing that for a year. So I think counseling is healthy, even for parents too. Like it's okay, you know, let it out, you know, scream, shout, punch it back, do something, you know? Yes, I'm definitely all about well-rounded success for kids so that they can do good with their literacy and their academics and all of those different skills, you know, it's just important, you know, so definitely appreciate you having you on today, just a little You're introduction welcome. to share about um, culturally responsive therapy with literacy and kids with dyslexia and all that, and I think all the work that you're doing is fantastic. Um, at the university level and on the International Dyslexia Association and the adult education that you're doing as well. I think that's fantastic. And um, Thank you. I wish you continued success with doing that with all of the folks that you're working with. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate all the work you're doing and, you know, the information that you're giving to parents and teachers and students disseminating. So um, keep up the good work. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.